from COVID-19 to affordable housing to evictions, I talk one-on-one -on -one with State Representative Marvin Pendarvis for this edition of Quentin's Post-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Post-Ups on Facebook. State Representative Marvin Pendarvis, welcome back to Quentin's Post-Ups. Uh, good morning, Quentin. It's always a pleasure and, a, and an honor to be on your show. This is about our fourth or fifth time doing it. I, I have lost count, but thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Anytime. I know, obviously, I was just reading the uh, article from the, uh, Barney Blakeney's Charleston Chronicle article about you, and the headline reads, Marvin Pendarvis, SC House Rep to take charge as he seeks third term. SC House District 113 incumbent Representative Marvin Pendarvis has been very busy during his very first term, two terms in office. As the state reaps in the grasps of coronavirus pandemic, P Pendarvis has maintained a focus on addressing constituent concerns in that regard and a keen eye on other issues of equal importance. What are consistent concerns right now in your mind? Well, um, it's interesting you said three years. Has it already been that that, that long? That time yes, sure does fly. Yes, but I'll tell you this, Queen. Um, over the last several months and, and even long before that, um, we had been hearing the same concerns from constituents. If you poll the district and you talk to people like we have been in multiple forms, we find that people are still uh, dealing with issues of uh, affordable housing, trying to find out um, what's going to be done to increase the availability. They know that Charleston is getting expensive to live and, and they want to make sure that they're part of the growth. Uh, there's real concerns about the evictions, um, not only with, with coronavirus, but long before that, there have been um, a number of, of people who have came to me and, and talked about their concerns when it comes to evictions because I was a proponent of, of changing the Landlord Tenant Law Act uh, to put more protections in it for tenants and so people are still concerned about that. Uh, they're concerned about food deserts. They know that in, in North Charleston on the lower end that there isn't access to healthy and quality foods, things that we know are important. They, they're concerned about better education and they want um, good infrastructure and so these are the main issues that I ran on those are the issues that people are, are talking to me about. And, you know, we've been fortunate to have worked on comprehensive solutions to address those. I'm in my time in office. Um, we've made strides in some areas and, and we're working to, to build on those successes. But we also know that um, there are some areas where we have, have not been as successful as we would like to be. But we know we were, um, we're navigating the political waters of Columbia well enough to, to be able to address those in a timely and orderly fashion. How are you floating doing this political water? Well, Columbia is an interesting beast. And, you know, as a rookie, as a freshman a few years ago, um, I learned that, you know, there's an old saying that um, oftentimes uh, the, the General Assembly is where good ideas come to die, right? <laughs> you can have the um the most <clears throat> the, the great idea you you can be as excited as as you want to be and and as um um passionate about particular issues uh, but if you you haven't done your homework or if you haven't you know developed the kinds of relationships that are necessary or or taking the time to try to understand how to move legislation through the political process uh, then you're going to be unsuccessful and that's not an easy task um, but we, we feel good about what we've been able to do in learning the process, understanding what it takes to get a bill from just being a bill to law. And, um, and we're equipped to do it. And, you know, that's what, this is one of the reasons why we feel like we're the best person in this race to, um, to represent District 113, because of the experience that we've exhibited over the last three years, the ability uh, to, um, to work with leadership, to, to work in a bipartisan manner, but more importantly, work on behalf of the constituents of District 113. And that's what they elected me to do three years ago. And, and that's what I'm asking them to reelect me to continue doing this year. And what have you done your homework on when in regards to COVID-19? Well, we've done a lot. You know, <clears throat> we pretty much suspended session for the rest of the year. And we went two months without meeting because it was, it was unsafe to do so, right? CDC put down regulations regarding social distancing. And we knew that we were in a, a time of, of self-quarantine. And then we also had to, <clears throat> we, we ended up in South Carolina getting the stay-at-home order. And so that prohibited us from meeting in, in a regular session. And so what I did was a lot of the homework went into, now that we have this new normal, we know COVID isn't going anywhere, we're going to have to adjust. So how do we address a lot of the needs of the communities as a result of COVID-19? 
particularly the the evictions. You know, I was very active on the eviction moratoriums, particularly when it comes to testing in rural rural communities and areas that need it. Increasing the availability of testing that's something that our Democratic and, and Black Caucus have been actively talking about. <clears throat> we have been done our homework on what kind of support small businesses need. Um, it goes without question um, the the impact that it's had on our, our local economy. Um, businesses of of all into the spectrum, uh, particularly uh, black owned businesses and, and women owned businesses. And so we know that um, it, it uh, up to us as legislators to, to come up with a plan to address that. And so a lot of my homework is, is centered around, we've got $1.9 billion from the CARES Act that's going to come into the state coffers to be able to, to help with COVID-19 and our response to it. And so the question becomes, how do we use that money um, smartly? How do we put it play in places that are that are necessary so that we're able uh, to, to to make sure that South Carolina comes out on the other side of this in a way um, that's, that's better and that's beneficial for all of its citizens? What places in 113 are really necessary for the CARES Act? Well, I'll tell you, I represent an interesting district you know if you drive from Somerville the northernmost point of my district all the way down to the southern end of North Charleston which is the southernmost point you'll see a, a myriad of all types of people of all types of incomes of all types of backgrounds um, but the most vulnerable area really is the southern end of North Charleston an area that has historically been neglected in an area that historically it needed investment but has not gotten it, has been unable to attract the kind of investment that's really going to transform that community. And so what I'm hoping to do is through the CARES Act, money that goes into these communities, particularly going to some of the small the businesses that are located there, um, I can tell you aside from the CARES Act, I was part of an effort through the organization that I'm on the board of, the Low Country Alliance of Model Communities, um, known as LAMPSI. And what we were able to do is approve some micro loans that will go out to many of the businesses in our service areas so that we're able to, to get them money and so that they're able to, to get on their feet. Because what people are, uh, what we realized is the CARES Act, a lot of that money dried up um, quickly, right? The small business loans and, and the PPP protection. And a lot of the, the businesses that and the people that I represent were left out of the equation. You know, many people who come from low income, um, black communities, um, communities that have historically been neglected were not contemplated in that and they fell to the bottom of the equation. A lot of that had to do with you had so many technically small businesses, i.e. the Los Angeles Lakers or the, the Kiowa Association where they were able to apply for these funds and get them, these, these multi-million and billion dollar organizations because you technically have to be a, an organization below $500, I mean, 500 employees, which is the definition. And so that was problematic because it didn't trickle down in the areas that, that were necessary. So I say that to say, one of the things that we're hoping is that in the CARES Act, the money that we're appropriating to the budget, we can put it in communities in distress. We can work on, you know, community health centers. We can address this, the businesses that are located there. We can try to hope, and in, 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 <clears throat> I've been told in the next round of CARES Act, they're going to be an em um, emphasis on infrastructure. Hopefully we can address infrastructure. Those are issues that had already existed long before COVID. Those ex issues have been only exacerbated by COVID. And so my hope is that we'll, we'll be able to use this as leverage uh, to, to, to sound the alarm on why we need to invest in those communities particularly. Because they're, you know, obviously I have a, a direct invested interest because it's in my district. More importantly, these are, these are our neighbors, these are our brothers and our sisters. These are people who have been, been hurt due to their no fault of their own. And it's our obligation to make sure we stand up for them. And so I'm hoping that that money for the CARES Act can be used to do that. And the article goes on to read this, affordable housing not only increases the quality of life for those it directly affects, but it acts as a national, natural stimulus to the local economies by providing more individuals and businesses with economic and educational opportunities. So what is the quality of life in your district? Ah, good question. Well, I'll tell you, um, people in my district, it depends on where you go, but I think overall the quality of life and is, is, is a want for more. Um, <clears throat> people aren't necessarily satisfied no matter where you go, um, whether it's in Somerville and you believe that the infrastructure can be better because of the congestion that you see constantly, 
whether you're in Liberty Hill and you look at the lack of affordable housing there and you recognize that we could do a better job of focusing on communities that have been neglected, whether you're on the southern end of, of North Charleston, Union Heights or Shakur, Cherokee, and you look at the um, the, the opportunities that have been lost, um, maybe the investments that, that could be put into these areas. And so people are, 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 are longing for more in, in various parts of the district. Um, they, they want their, um, their, their government to work for them. Um, they recognize that government isn't going to solve all of their problems, um, but they, they want it to, to be, to stand in the gap um, and, 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 and do the things that it's supposed to do and take care of them um, in, in the role that, that they've committed to. And so if you go across the district, people are longing for more. I would say quality of life in, in District 113 is one where we're longing for more, where we, we need more investment. It, it's, it's completely necessary. And um, they elected me to do it. And, and that's my commitment to them that we'll work um, day and night to ensure that they get the kind of quality of life where they can live, where they can work, where they can play in a place um, that cares about them in a place that's full of the investment that's going to make them and their family successful long term. Barney also writes this quote, he's utilized experiences and skills learned to bring fresh ideas about housing and issue views as a top priority in District 113, economic inclusion and job security to the table. And he will apply those skills to developing legislative legislation that is about public health care, child care and education that reflect the core values of South Carolinians as the state population continues to grow, he said. What fresh ideas do you have now for housing? Oh, well, where do I begin? I mean, I'll tell you, that was the singular most important issue for me when I ran. And that's probably the most, um, the, 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 the one issue that I worked on the most in my time in office um, on several fronts. I'll tell you, <clears throat> one, we've got to do something about the, um, the eviction crisis. And we have to ensure that tenants are protected in a meaningful way. And I was pleased to see that there's a housing court, but ultimately what we need to do is we need housing courts across the state of South Carolina. We need to be able to have dedicated places where tenants can go with the landlords and litigate their issue. We need to reform the Landlord Tenant Act and, and, and get into a way where the process is streamlined more, but also give tenants more protection. Uh, we don't need to make it so easy for landlords to be able to file evictions. You can do so for about $40 in South Carolina. Uh, we need to increase your threshold, not because we're trying to unfairly penalize landlords, but a lot of landlords are using that as a tactic to continue to file eviction after eviction after eviction because there's not much that you have to bring to the table. And so in the evictions, we have to do that. And I'm hoping that through a reform, through housing courts, and also the a, a public defender system, um, to represent tenants. Tenants oftentimes go into these court hearings without representation, and we need to be able to give them the kind of representation that you would get if you were a criminal defendant and you needed some kind of defense and you've got the public defender system there to take care of you. It's a pilot program in Charleston that is providing the representation to tenants, but I'm hoping we can expand that across the entire county and across the entire state. If you look at a lot of states that have, that have been progressive in this nature, um, they've been able to say, understand the need for for better housing, understand the, the, the issues that tenants face, and they've been able to dedicate resources to make sure that there's a housing court and representation. Um, that's on the eviction. And so that's how we address housing on that front. But one of the other ideas that we need to be doing when it comes to increasing the availability of affordable housing is we need to incentivize developers to come in these communities to do so. I introduced the inclusionary zoning legislation when I first ran. It was introduced before I got there. I, I kind of took up off of the build up off the momentum that my predecessor, Seth Whipper, had um, started and, and, and David Mack, they had been working on the inclusionary zoning bill. And what that did was essentially tell developers, we want you to build and we're going to incentivize you to do so by requiring you to build affordable housing, but giving you, a, a, you know, expediting the permitting process and getting rid of any roadblocks that may delay or increase the burden on you, whether it's increase, you know, whether it's these sewer fees or tap fees or whether it's, um, whatever fee that might be um, imposed upon by a municipality, we want to get rid of that. And then thirdly, um, I introduced the Opportunity Zone Enhancement Act, which in a lot of ways will be able to work on affordable housing. I think if we, when used the right way, I know that there's been, uh, you know, a, a number of opinions, um, Senator Scott and, and Congressman Clyburn have been extremely vocal about how their views on, on Opportunity Zone. I'm the Opportunity Zone, I'm of the opinion of this. When used the right way, 
um, opportunity zones can be the most trans uh, transformational investment tool of our time when used the right way. Um, the way I look at it is we can have these investors going into communities that need it, but understanding the needs of these communities, being focused on improving the lives of the people in the communities, not gentrifying them, not displacing them, but working to increase jobs, you know, require, you know, going into these communities to provide tangible investments that's going to work on education and healthcare and infrastructure. That's what we can do when these investors come in. They come in because they see a tax benefit, but if we can require Require them uh, to provide something more substantive in these communities, then these communities can be transformed. And so I think you do that, you can you can benefit housing in that way. So through Opportunity Zones, um, you know, we've been working in a creative way. We've been working to try to address affordable housing through the Inclusionary Zoning Act. We've been working on trying to address evictions, which deals with housing uh, through a lot of the um, unique reforms like the housing court, like I mentioned before. But I say all of that to say, Ultimately, what's going to be necessary, Quentin, for us to really get to the point of addressing housing is we have to understand that we cannot work on one end while we continue. We can work on the housing end, but if we don't increase wages and if we don't improve the lives of people, then we're going to continue to be back in this situation down the road. And so it's going to require us uh, to work to make sure that wages, you know, wages are continuing to be stagnant. And that's why we've been hurting a lot of wages. I think if you, if you work on wages, you give people the ability uh, to afford to live where they work, right? Uh, to afford to, to make rent and not necessarily be faced with evictions in many instances. Um, that's what's really to the point. You know, we, we scoff at the idea of $15 an hour, which even that isn't really enough to take care of a family in 2020. But we scoff at the idea because of the burden that it may have on businesses and this, that, and the third. But ultimately, what we're seeing is we have to take care of folks who, who are the fabric of our communities, who I, I say the backbone of our communities, um, the working class people. Um, and, and, and the way to do that is increase wages. And if we do that, you will see um, a direct impact on housing as a result of that. So that's that. You talked earlier about evictions and obviously the land uh, landlords. What do you want landlords to bring to the table with this issue? So I've had conversations with landlords. Um, I'm sure landlords in many respects probably hate me. Um, I've heard from a number of them um, and, and many of them are my friends. And, and I'll tell this uh, to landlords. Um, I'm not out to punish you. I'm not out to make your life harder. I'm not out to do anything that's going to cut into your bottom line. Um, my job as a representative of the people is to protect people who are in the most vulnerable situations. And so what I want landlords to do to bring to the, I want, I want them to bring to the table, understanding the needs of people, recognizing that we could, um, we recognizing this, Yes, we know there are bad tenants, just like there are bad landlords. Yes, we know there are people who don't take care of their property. There are people who are doing illegal activities on properties. There are people who probably are taking advantage of a number of concessions in, in society that make life for landlords more difficult. I understand that. I get that. But just like we don't want a bunch of bad apples to spoil the bunch on the landlord end with a lot of the slumlords that exist, we don't need to do that on a tenant end. And so I ask landlords to, to have empathy, to understand the position of many tenants um, and to work with them in many instances um, and to not put profit over people. Um, we, you know, I think in the long run, if we don't tear, take, take care of tenants, um, it's going to affect landlords indirectly in a, in a real way. You know, there's the, the housing authority put out a study that talks about the impact that housing will have on our local economy and that if we don't do it, it's about $9 billion impact, um, the lack of affordable housing that it has. And that if we don't do anything about housing, that if we don't address it, that if we don't do anything about eviction, it's going to have a cost. We're going to bear the cost one way or the other. Landlords are going to bear the cost one way or the other through the, you know, through more social programs that's going to take out of their pocket in a lot of ways. And so recognize the indirect impact of the, of the action that you're, you're taking is going to have and have some empathy. Um, know that I want to work with you. I, I tell my, one of my good friends, 
um, you know, who I, I went to high school with, and he and I have a, a number of conversations, and he's been very vocal and passionate um, uh, about that. His name is James McLeod, and if he's listening, you know, you know, hey, James. Um, but what I what I tell him is, and, and he and I have been honest, I say, listen, I will be more than glad to meet with any landlord. I'll be more than glad to meet with any or apartment organization, meet with any any um, advocacy groups with landlords and talk about your issues. I want to bring both people to the table because I hear from tenants, I hear from landlords. I, a lot of landlords I hear from are private landlords. A lot of them are doing the right thing, right? And the way I look at it is if you're doing the right thing, there shouldn't be no issue. There's the old saying that a hit dog will holler. And so, you know, normally if you aren't doing right, a lot of times you're going to have issues with any kind of change because it's not going to enable you to do the wrong that you've been doing. But if you've been doing right, you have no issue with it because it's not going to affect you anyway. But I implore landlords, work with me, talk with me, reach out to me. I promise you, email me, info at marvinpendarvis.com. Call me, 843-225-2520. We can have a conversation about these issues and, and work to a, a viable path forward. It's going to take all of us. Um, but understand that I'm not out to get you. Understand that I'm, I'm here because I have an obligation to the people. You are part of the group, right? You're part of the people as well. And so we have to bring all parties to the table um, and work in, in unison and, and do the best that we can and recognize that it's going to be an imperfect solution. No one's going to ultimately be happy with what's done. That's the part of negotiation coming to the table. You get a little bit of what you want here, you get a, and you give a little bit over there. And it's never going to be perfect, but understand for the greater good, we've got to do something and that there's going to take concessions on both parts, the landlords and the tenants, for us to ultimately get to where we need to be um, in North Charleston and ultimately in this, in this society. And what's the imperfect solution for wages? Yeah, well, we need to at least at the basic 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 level we need to um we need to go to fifteen dollars an hour that's the basic solution for wages i'll be honest with you that's the basic solution for wages we need to go to fifteen dollars an hour um as as a bare minimum and the, as, as as a bare minimum we need to at least go to fifteen dollars an hour um i i implore and encourage the mayors across the county you know whether it's mayor tecklenburg downtown mayor summy in north charleston um the name of the mayor in um, in Mount Pleasant. Um, I think Will Haney, yes, um, the new mayor out in, in, in Somerville. I implore you all to look into it and, and, and really say, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to take care? At, at the very least, make sure you know, what can you do to pay your employees that? And then we can look at something that's going to at least show some initiative. Um, I know it's a large step, um, but the only way we're going to get to progress in this country and to really make any significant change is we, we have to suffer a little bit. And when I say that is, if you look at the great movements of our time, they were, it, 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 led, it, it had to do with a lot of suffering. We're not, we have to give a little to get some. And so I, I, what I mean is a lot of these municipalities when it comes to wages have to understand that the greater good is, outweighs on whatever impact that we think is gonna have on us personally. And we have to do, we have to understand that we have to take care of people. And, and that long-term this is gonna have a beneficial impact on society. Um, but we have to give a little. Um, it's gonna take um, some concessions on us and, and those concessions may hurt. And, um, but the, you know, understand what you're doing it for and understand that it, it's the, the morally and just thing to do and that we'll be better because of it. So I think at a bare minimum, we need to increase wages to $15 an hour. I'm a vocal opponent of it and, and I'll continue beating that horse because it's necessary. Uh, we're long behind it, $7.25 an hour. I was working at McDonald's on Rivers Avenue when they entered, when they increased the wage. In fact, I was excited because it was a three-year plan when it was like 5.15 when I started working, when I was working at Chick-fil-A, my first job at 15 in 2004. And then they entered, and then they increased it to like $6 or something. It was 6.75 and it was 7.25. And I remember being excited for that little, that little raise in, in 2009, I think when the final phase of it went through, when I, at that point in time, I was in college, but came home to work at McDonald's. And I'm like, man, that was 11 years ago, right? You know, I'm 30 now, like 19, 20 at the time. We're still at that same level. But the you look at where society has gone in the last 10 years and everything costs more. We, you know, we, we're requiring more of our taxpayers in a lot of ways. The housing costs are more. Health care seems like it's, it, it, it's more in a lot of ways. And, and, and I mean, so much of what we do is costing us more money, but we haven't done anything to make sure people can support that because we haven't increased wages. And so that's problematic on, on so many fronts. And I'm hoping that we recognize we've got to do something about that. 
what do you hope the city of Charleston, city of North Charleston, that is, will give as far as giving a little and getting some back as far as getting a grocery store on the south end? So I will commend this North City of North Charleston on this because I, I've had my issues with some of their stances on things, but I will commend Mayor Summy and his staff on this. Um, they've made a number of attempts to get a grocery store. Um, there was at one point a time when they had really rolled out the red carpet for, and I can't remember the grocer, but um, right on there near the old Naval Hospital, they had rolled out the red carpet pretty much you know, saying, we're going to give you half a million dollars. We're going to make sure you don't really have to pay any kind of taxes, property taxes on the property for X number of years. It's a significant time um, in exchange for coming to bring a grocery store. And they still didn't. The problem is this, Quinn. A lot of it is, and you, I, I, I applaud the city because they're doing the best that they can with what they know how. Um, but the problem is the grocers, financially, for them, it doesn't make sense. For them, they're looking at it as, am I going to make a profit? Yeah, you can give me this money, but is it going to be beneficial for me long term? And they're looking at it like the communities around them doesn't support it. So here's what I say. Here's how you get a grocery. It's going to be a long-term approach. I think we have to continue trying to encourage grocers to come during the South End because we need to. Food deserts are real. It's having a long, it's having an impact. Long term, what we need to be doing is if the grocers don't see the need to come into the communities and if they see it feel like it's not going to bring a profit, that says a lot about that community. So what can North Charleston do? What can Mayor Summy and his council do? How about we invest in those communities in a meaningful way? How about we bring up the quality of life? How about we bring up the income levels of those people in those communities so that they're able to come into these areas and say, you know what, they can support a grocery store, right? That's a long term approach. But we've got to be able to uplift people. You know, the old saying that we love to quote in politics, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? We've got to be able to be that rising tide on the southern and North Charleston. We've got to invest in jobs. We've got to invest in infrastructure. We've got to invest in health care. We've got to invest in education. We've got to invest in housing. We've got to invest in these fundamental things that are going to move society forward, move these areas forward. That's going to transform them in a meaningful way and get them to a direction where people feel good about themselves, People feel good about the area they live in. They feel safe and secure in their homes, but they feel like the city and government is working for them and they're doing everything they can to support them. The grocery stores will come. That's a long-term approach. That takes investment. That's not going to happen overnight. Short term, I think we need to be creative in how we deal with the grocery stores. If right now the grocers aren't coming, then let's get to the grocers. What do I mean by that? There's a national program that my team and I are actively working on. Literally, I reached out to Lyft representatives uh, two weeks ago. There's a national program where they're essentially recognizing the impact that grocery, um, the lack of grocery, grocery stores is having on a uh, food desert. And they've got a program where their drivers are, you know, you can, you can go through the, um, you, can, you can call them and let them know that you need someone to pick them up and take them to a grocery store. You know, that's a creative solution. I had my team work on a proposal to North Charleston City Council last year about this issue. One of the, another idea is how about we use our bus system? Maybe we can be creative in how we use Carter and transporting people uh, to grocery stores. Maybe having a line that says, you know, we're going to go into this neighborhood, take people that need to or bring groceries to them, you know, and take you to own a, to the grocery store, get what you need so that you're able to get, and get what you, get what you need, right? Uh, that's, though, we need to be creative in these solutions. We can't sit here and be upset. Well, we could be upset that they're not coming and we could do everything we can to try. But if they're not going to come, we've got to take matters in our own hand and be proactive. And so on the short term, we can be innovative in how we, we, we take people to the grocery stores by the infrastructure that we have in place with the bus systems or using these national organizations that are part <clears throat> like Lyft and, and, and we could do it that way. And then long term, we know that the ultimate way that we're going to solve this is by investing in the communities that's going to allow and enable some of these grocery stores to come. And then lastly, yeah, we can't forget about the um, the existing cooperatives that are there. You know, Fresh Future Farms is on the southern end. It's in my district. They do a good job of trying to provide fresh produce to people. And we've got to do a better job of supporting. I know the city of North Charleston was um, supportive in, in them and extending their lease so that they can occupy that space for a long period of time. But we've got to do more to support that, uplift that. That's a viable option. Um, we, we have to recognize that and, and, and recognize that we can do a better job of, of promoting that to the public and, and making it so viable so that people are able to, to, to utilize it in a meaningful way. And so it's, it's a comprehensive issue. It's one that's going to take a comprehensive solution. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm cautiously optimistic about the progress that we're making. Um, and, and, you know, um, the people reelect me, um, we'll continue working to that end. 
Minneapolis. How do you look at it as an African-American male? How do you look at it as an attorney? And how do you look at it as a state legislator? I'll be honest with you, Quinn. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. And at times I feel helpless. And I think a lot of my view has changed recently because of the last um, six weeks. You know, I'm, I'm a father now. And so to a boy, to a black boy. And as a black man in this country, it hurts when you come to the realization that you can be doing good. You can go to school. You can get an education. You can try to do all these things that society says you should do that in some ways would insulate you from so many of the ills of our world. And yet that isn't enough. And it's frustrating. Um, I was up late last night watching the news like so many of us. And I had a moment when I just sat there because I really felt helpless. I felt helpless because I'm in the, I'm in elected office. People look at me as a, a resource. People look at me in a position of influence. They look at me as someone who can do something about issues in our society. And I drive up to Columbia every single week for five months out of the year from January to May. And we debate, we introduce laws and we debate laws and we have these robust discussions about things that impact the state of South Carolina. And I wonder if I'm doing enough. I'm wondering, despite all that we're doing, despite all the, the conversation that we're having, we're still seeing the same things happen in our community. And so I feel powerless in a lot of ways <clears throat> because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as an elected official. I stay active, I vote, I try to engage people, I try to encourage people to be active. We do all these things and we still see the system operate as it is intended to do, which doesn't contemplate us as black people. And that's a reality that we have yet to come to grips with in this country. And it's frustrating, it angers me because I know that Actually, I don't know. I was going to say, I know that we can do better, but can we? Have we? Has this country shown us that we're better than this? Because honestly, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today. I was talking to Representative J.A. Moore and another friend of mine, Travis Williams, and we were having a conversation about this. And J.A. said something that just struck me. He said, you know, I'm the son of, a civil right, of the civil rights movement. <clears throat> he said that um, his dad was very active in the civil rights movement. <clears throat> and his dad marched and he was very, he was on the front lines and he fought for change and he advocated for change in so many ways. And he did that because he wanted to make sure that the next generation had a better life than he did. And then Jay said, his father died in 2012 and three years later, his sister was, which is, his sister was murdered by a white supremacist in Charleston. And he said to me, all the work that my dad did in the sixties and they're still dealing with the same issues today. Are we really getting better? Are we really learning from our mistakes? Do we really understand the position that African Americans feel in this country? Do we really? We say that we pay lip service to a lot of things, but do we really understand? And so it's frustrating because yes, I'm going to continue trying to push and advocate and do all those things because it's what I was called to do. It's what I'm prepared to do. And I'm thankful to be in a position to, to push some kind of influence or push some kind of change. But people are reeling in this country, Clinton. People are angry. They're rightfully frustrated. And we don't know what to do. We don't know because you got, you can do all the right things. You can say all the right things. And you can still have a system that, I mean, a man, an officer sat on a man's neck, put his knee on a man's neck for eight minutes. The man's crying for his mom, crying for help. Well, three other officers watched it. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've just, I guess I've just never been hurt by any, I've been hurt by all of the incidents. I've not been moved to the degree that I have been now. And maybe it's the cumulative effect, the fact that it just keeps happening. And at some point you reach a breaking point 
And maybe that's where I'm at because I'm just angry. I'm, I'm doing a lot of self searching and soul searching about my role in this process and, and what I can do. But, you know, as Representative Wendell Gilliard says all the time, and it sometimes feel like we're just twiddling Dixie and that, you know, we just, what are we, what are we really doing? Um, because we, we say all these things and yet there are people, all people want to talk about now is the looting and the riots in Minneapolis. Folks that just seem to overlook the reasons and the frustrations of the people why they're engaging in whatever activity they're engaging in. We just seem to be focusing on so many of the other things because, again, we always look to condemn first. Um, we never look to understand or to, to sympathize, whether you agree with it or not, whether that will be your preferred method or not, we seem to always do this, this, this inclination to condemn because that's what we've been trained to do. And I guess I'm just frustrated. I'm tired of it. I, I really am tired of it. And so I, I hurt and feel for the family um, of, of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. And I, I, I really, I, I really wish we, we were better than what we were, what we are. Um, I really do. We know it here in Charleston with Walter Scott. You know, I, I remember it vividly. I remember, you know, when it happened and the, the front page of the paper the next day and, and how we felt afterward. But we're still having it. That was five years ago. And we're still dealing with the same issue. You know, I don't expect things to change overnight, but I mean, come on. I mean, we, we we're just, uh, I mean, it's rough. There's a real race problem in this country. You know, we're dealing with this global health pandemic, but, you know, I would argue that racism is also a health, pan a health problem in this country. And we're dealing with them both. We're dealing with COVID-19, we're dealing with racism. And we have to weed it out. And, and I'm tired of folks putting the burden on black people to do this. It's not up to us to try to solve um, uh, the racism. It's not up to us to solve racism. We can do all that we can. It's up to white folks to understand. Now, you can't change a man's heart, but they've got you either. Have, I, I was listening to someone, I forgot who said it, but you've got two choices in this country. I think Bakari Sellers said it. You can either be racist or you can be anti racist. You can't be silent. You can't just say, yeah, I'm not racist and feel okay about it. You've got to be active in weeding it out and, and, and condemning your neighbor when you know that they're speaking out or saying things that you know isn't wrong. Too many white folks are complicit in this because of their silence, and it's frustrating. It, it is completely, completely, completely frustrating. And it's not enough to just say, oh, yeah, I'm not racist. I don't see color. I have black friends. That means nothing to me. What are you actively doing to weed this out? The burden should not be on black folks. We didn't cause this. They brought us over to this country and enslaved us for 300 years. We're not the ones that caused this. Okay? It's not up to us to get rid of this. It's not up to us to get rid of this. It's up to white folks to understand their role in this process, to understand that they have an obligation uh, to, to speak out and to speak again. And it may not be the publicly acceptable thing to say, but I'm tired and tired of being politically correct because of what folks may feel. You know what? The only thing we're going to do, the only way we're going to get change in this country is folks to feel uncomfortable. I want people to feel uncomfortable. Because that's the good thing. That's a great thing. That means you recognize an issue. Now let's move forward. Now let's do something about it. I'm sick of tired of folks just being complicit. And we see the same things and the same things again. And no one wants to speak out because they're afraid of retribution. If you're at a job and folks are upset because of your views of how you feel that black folks are being um, targeted in this country, then you know what? They've got a problem. They've got a problem. Maybe that's not a place you need to be at. We've just got a lot of soul searching to do in this country. I can go on and on about it, but I don't want to extend the time. I know you got, I don't know how much time you got a lot on this Zoom, but I'm just frustrated. I'm just frustrated. State Representative Marvin Pendarvis, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you. It's our first time doing it on Zoom, and it's always a pleasure. You take care, my friend. Likewise. <laughs>